I'll just be saying uh, while replying to the comments. Okay, thanks a lot, thanks a lot, everyone. We are going to begin now. <coughs> okay. So let us begin. Hello, okay, just let me know if you guys can see me because I'm just using this software uh, for the first time, so I'm not really sure. Just give me one comment with yes and I'll just begin. You can see me? Okay. Chalo, great. So we are going to begin today. First of all, I'm going to give you, okay, first of all, I'm going to give you my introduction. Uh, my name is Hina Pardeshi and uh, I am uh, the writer of uh, Deceived. Deceived is my first novel. Uh, I've also collaborated on an anthology called Life in Reverse. It's actually a nonfiction project and I've contributed my story to it. I'm also working on another three projects. Uh, those three projects are actually in the works. I've signed contracts for two of them and uh, my, okay, yes. And my agent is working on the third one. So those are the projects that I'm currently working on. My second book that is going to come out probably early next year is Sinister Town. Sinister Town is a horror novel. That's why I wanted to do a horror uh, webinar because I have been working on a horror book from last five years and I have done a lot of research and horror is something that I usually uh, lean towards uh, even in my psychological thrillers, you know. So... Let us begin with today's webinar that is decoding horror genre for writers. <coughs> okay, so before we begin, I would like to just let you know that we'll be doing this webinar for almost one and a half hours. It might just extend to two hours, it might not. So I'm really not going to put a timestamp on it right now. But <coughs> Uh, I do have uh, two workshops coming in November and uh, I would like to offer discounts to whoever books those workshops uh, during the time of the webinar. Now I know that the it's very limited time so I'm going to extend it till midnight today. I'm going to be sharing the details of uh, my workshop. One is fiction writing for beginners. It's for beginner writers. It is a two-day workshop uh, and it will have lectures of uh, two to three hours uh, each day. So we are going to be having four to six hours of lecture. And the other uh, workshop is novel writing masterclass in which I cover writing a novel from starting to ending, right from finding the idea. Uh, till finishing your book, I cover a lot of range of topics and I will be sharing the documents with you. I guess I'll do it in the WhatsApp group. If you guys haven't already been added to the WhatsApp group for this webinar, then just leave your numbers here. Uh, I'll delete your comment with the numbers after I have your numbers or just uh, uh, email me your phone numbers and I'll add you to the group because I'll be sharing the details of my workshop there. So if you book the workshops before midnight today, you'll get 25% flat off. Uh, if not, if you do it afterwards, then you'll have to pay the full price of it uh, as per whatever the workshop is, right? I do have four batches planned for each workshop. So I will also be sharing those details with you. Uh, but for now, I would just like to begin with the webinar because my throat is really not going to be <laughs> cooperating with me a lot today. So let us begin with decoding horror genre for writers. Uh, I'll just share the next image. Okay, now in front of your screen, 
you will be able to see some images that I'm gonna show that might just overlap with my camera because you know yes because that's actually the presentation but I'm working with this software for the first time so um, I wasn't really sure about how to uh, add the presentation so I'm just doing it image by image so if you guys want me to repeat any topic just let me know uh, if you have any questions just uh, leave them in the comment section I'll check them after each and every section and then answer them <coughs> so let us begin with describing horror so what is horror fiction the main question right I would really like to read your interpretation of horror so please go ahead and comment in the comment section uh, I do have notes here so I'm gonna read from them whenever I have to because I have memorized everything so okay fiction in any medium intended to scare unsettle or horrify the audience is known as horror fiction anything that can potentially scare you horrify you or even unsettle you comes under horror this definition is a bit vague but that is the reason why so many works on so many different platforms are uh, categorized in a wrong way as horror even though they are not actually horror for example uh, the book I'm forgetting the name it's a latest release by Stephen King the Institute by Stephen King was actually given uh, a Goodreads award of best horror of 2019 which was actually pretty wrong because the Institute was not a horror fiction it was more of a speculative fiction and uh, more of a science fiction I would say but uh, people misinterpret genres a lot and because of this loose definition of horror you know uh, they tend to categorize novels wrong in a wrong way so that's why that happened but um, the Institute is not exactly horror right now I'm going to share two quotes, two very important quotes that are going to summarize uh, what horror is. And the first one is from the master, H.P. Lovecraft, master of the horror genre. The oldest and the strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear fear of the unknown and that is something so true we all are so scared of something that we are not either sure about or we do not know about the fear of the unknown is the biggest fear that is actually exploited in horror genre the next quote is by Daryl Schweister it's a German name so the pronunciation is off obviously but he is a science fiction historian and he also has something to say <coughs> about horror. In the simplest sense, a horror story is one that scares us. And the true horror story requires a sense of evil, not in necessarily in a theological sense, but the menaces must be truly menacing, life-destroying and antithetical to happiness. Now, this is one point that I, I will be elaborating on further in the webinar because fear and the menace, the menace that we basically talk about is not necessarily uh, has to have either a spiritual or a physical connect or... Uh, origin uh, it it can just be something uh, metaf metaphorical and uh, uh, metanonymy uh, kind you know so we are going to talk all about it but first I would like to explore and discuss the history of horror genre with you all so I'll just change the image and then we are going to look at 
okay so okay fine okay we are going to discuss the history of horror literature in a bit first i would like to share pillars of horror fiction the six pillars on which the entire horror genre is based on <coughs> now i would like you all to please take notes of whatever you see fit because i will not be providing notes for uh this webinar it takes a lot of time and i've ba barely made some notes and some of them are handwritten you know so I, i won't be providing the notes so please just take a note of whatever you feel is uh important for you uh, or can help you in writing or understanding uh though this video will be available later on so you can do that later as well so the pillars of horror fiction are i'll just open my presentation that i've been looking at it gets easier for me okay so the first pillar is unease i'm just going to name them because they are pretty self explanatory if you have doubts in anything you can just ask me unease revulsion dread fright horror and terror okay now unease is basically making the readers uncomfortable okay it actually begins slowly so we are kind of going according to a scale from where we go from mild to intense okay so the first one is unease just making your readers feel a little uncomfortable sorry second is revulsion revulsion is making your readers feel grossed out now that can be because of gore blood um body mutilation or anything else you know there's so many scope okay there are a lot of questions coming i see two questions okay i i will be answering them uh, let me just complete this bit okay revulsion then the next one is dread now what is dread dread is basically the anticipation of for something that you know is not going to be pleasant and it just increases in intensity as the time uh, of waiting decreases and that is dread for you so the next one is fright frightening your audiences frightening your readers with crazy scenes then comes terror and then comes horror now there are a lot of definitions floating around on the internet about terror and horror but <coughs> we are going to discuss what exactly terror and horror are here so i'm just going to give you a basic idea about what exactly is the difference in terror and horror okay just a second okay terror terror is a feeling of dread and anticipation that precedes the horrifying event okay okay now i would like to tell you all uh yes yes i will be giving a lot of examples of movies and uh books i'm just getting started so i just want to get a couple of concepts cleared before we uh, go into the details right so that we have uh, uh, basically i've already said the modus operandi so let us just uh, take it slow so that everyone can grasp plus i'm pretty sure not everyone still made it and i'm pretty sure people are still going to come so let us just take it slowly and i will be answering all your questions and i'll actually be taking a lot of examples so we'll be discussing uh, a lot of horror elements okay so yeah i was telling you the difference between horror and terror uh, first we are going to talk about terror because terror comes first uh even on the scale of intensity but also on the scale of events that happen okay events that happen in a story that are called plot so terror is actually 
event that precedes the horrifying incident and horror is the event that happens or the feeling uh, that occurs in the protagonists and in the audi audiences after the horrifying event is over, after the terrible event is over. So terror is basically the anticipation of the bad thing. Okay, let's just call that incident a bad thing. But horror is what follows that bad thing. So in short, if I have to tell you, generally terror is related to anxiousness and fearfulness and uh, horror is what is the strong emotion that comes after the bad thing has happened okay when it actually sits in your mind uh, when it dawns on you completely what has happened okay so basically <coughs> if I have to give you an example uh, terror would be the smell of death, the smell of decay. You, are, you have a protagonist who walks into a room and they're able to smell something bad, right? Now, imagine stumbling upon a room that has a rotting dead body. Obviously, it's going to smell horrible and because we've laid out the settings that way, even our character is going to feel uh, really anxious and really horrible you know that sense of impending doom so when they feel that that is terror but when they actually stumble upon the corpse the dead body that is the point where your character will feel horror that is the point where your reader should also feel horror because the feelings of your character should be able to to uh, deliver prop should be able to be delivered properly to your readers so they have they should be feeling the same feelings of uh, in fact they actually should be feeling more feelings than your character but more intensely but at least they should be feeling what your character is feeling right and that depends on show don't tell which is a technique that i'm not gonna go into right now i actually teach that technique in my workshop so i'm gonna leave it for that so this is the basic difference between horror and terror. Now we are going to see or talk about the history of horror literature because I really think when we are talking about horror, knowing the history of horror literature is pretty relevant. You know, we need to know where it all started. So we are going to go back in time to 14th century. In the 14th century, and this is a bit of information. This is the bit that I've gathered from uh, the preface of a very famous translated work from German that is Faust by Goethe. So... I actually came to know about this because uh, before that I had the notion that uh, the horror genre was actually evolved in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, but no, it actually goes back to the 14th century and I might actually go back uh, further. But uh, this is what I know. So I know till 14th century. Uh, in 14th century, demonology and angelography that is the concept of demons and angels was very prevalent and there was a lot of folk tales and uh, bedtime stories that were told by nannies and grannies in Europe okay so those stories were actually the start of the genre now, those stories were heavily inspired from the religious texts of the Romans and the Greek. So, they have a lot of resemblance. That's why a lot of stories come from uh, Romans and Greek mythology and uh, <coughs> their folk folklore. And also German folklore is pretty prevalent, you know, pretty important uh, when we talk about horror fiction. So in the 14th century, in the entire Europe, the stories of occult lore, 
witches, ghosts, magic, hell and heaven were being circulated by noble people, by the folklorists and they were later picked up by a lot of great poets, a lot of great writers and they were then published in their respective languages and that's how the birth of the horror genre uh, basically that's how horror genre was conceived you know from uh, the tales that were told to especially the kids but also around campfires to each other moving on from 15th to 17th century now this is a very important century because <coughs> in the medieval french literature you will find a lot of works of famous artists based on werewolves. Now, there are a lot of unpronounceable names of French writers and poets and uh, artists that actually inspired the entire werewolf concept. So, werewolf came in the werewolves basically came into the horror genre in the 15th to 17th century a lot of works were even commissioned throughout Europe and a lot of writers and artists and poets were paid a lot of money uh, to portray werewolves in different ways and different stories to incorporate them because people suddenly got obsessed with werewolves okay <coughs> While this was happening, hap sorry, while this was happening in the French side, uh, in the German and the Romanian side, what happened was in the Hungarian side, what happened was there were a lot of rumors about one particular personality who was very infamous for his alleged war crimes. And that personality, okay, I'll be answering that question in two minutes. Okay, and that personality was, I'm going to take the correct name, Prince of Wallachia, Vlad the Third, our Count Dracula. So, when people were getting obsessed with the werewolves, we actually had uh this very bad kind of sensationalized journalism going on uh, especially in germany about uh, a soldier a count basically who was a part of uh, the war uh, and who allegedly committed a lot of war crimes after returning and <clears throat> then simultaneously there were a lot of murders, kidnapping and killings happening uh, on the streets of a lot of European countries. And then what people did was they clubbed the uh, infamous personality of Vlad the Third and these killings and together they made up vampires. So, werewolves and vampires were actually born in the 15th to 17th century around the same time in different parts, you know. So, and when people read them, obviously they liked the concept. So, obviously again, uh, they it just spread like wildfire. And obviously this was the inspiration behind the Dracula book that is going to come in the later centuries. Now... I'll just answer this one question that Ashish uh, has. These stories were part of 14th century Europe literature or they were collected from around the world and compiled in Europe literature? No, they were Europe literature. I'll actually tell you uh, everything actually I have read because I am also doing a course from Harvard Extension program about modern uh, marvels of world literature. But in that, we are covering a lot of old literature as well, the traditional literature. And most of them was, and most of them were originated in Europe itself. 
the Europeans did everything, not the English, not the Americans, the Europeans did everything. And then those works were actually translated and brought and then other writers of other countries were influenced throughout the world and then they started writing. <coughs> so actually the uh, base was set by the European literature, the European writers, poets, artists, storytellers. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Now moving on to the next century, that is the 18th century. The 18th century now saw, after 15th, 16th, 17th century, the 18th century saw a new breakthrough in and all of a sudden there was this boom in dark romanticism, the dark romance theme. And that led to the concept of a woman being menaced can be a person, can be menaced by a person, can be menaced by a spirit, you know, it's just, uh, it was up to their imagination. So the concept was of women being menaced in a gloomy castle. Now, does this ring any bell? That was the foundation of Gothic fiction. The gloomy castle, right? The mansion, the manners, you know. So that's how with the dark romanticism, the dawn, uh, the rise of dark romanticism came the birth of Gothic fiction. Now, there is a very, very, very prominent writer known as Anne Radcliffe who is who published three, four novels in succession, they were actually the main works that inspired all the writers after her who wrote gothic fiction. So basically, if I have to be really like straight, Anne Radcliffe is the one who invented uh, gothic fiction. Now, when we talk about Anne Ratcliffe, there, there is actually a very uh, big uh, controversy. I won't say exactly a controversy, but I, I find it very controversial because what modern uh, literature people say, oh yes, I'm going to talk about the uh, horror bit, how these genres are actually depicted as horror and why they are counted as horror. So, what they say is, Horace Walpole, the author of the book Castle of Otranto, they say, he was the one who invented gothic fiction. But actually, the truth is, and I have done a lot of research, the truth is, and Ratcliffe's work were what inspired Horace Walpole and therefore he is not the inventor or he is not the one who invented gothic fiction. It was Anne Ratcliffe. So I have a very firm stand on it. Now that's what I believe in. Anyway, so if you want to pick up Anne Ratcliffe's work, you can definitely go for the very famous ones that is the Mysteries of Odolfo and then there are a couple of others that I will be sharing the names of uh, okay the Italian the confessional of the black penitents and the romance of the forest now you will find a lot of dark romanticism in these books but what I'm talking about is the goth settings is the goth what about mythological horror? I'm, I'm going to come to the mythological horror. Actually, uh, if we are talking about mythological horror, I think we would have to go back to 14th century because uh, when I said that a lot of religion, the religion was what inspired those folklores and folk tales, 
about the demon, demonology and the angelography. Uh, what happened is they were basically the uh, mythologies of the Romans and the Greek. So if you want to talk about mythological horror, I think it started in 14th century. It would be 14th century. Okay, so moving forward. So this now Gothic has taken, Gothic fiction has taken roots in the 18th century. <coughs> and now we are going to move forward to 19th century. In 19th century, the first English vampire story was created. Why I say not written but created because it was a translation of Wake Not the Dead which happens to be a German book. It was a German book about vampires and that work was translated to English and that is how it became the first vampire book in English language. So as I said the English literature basically when we study literature we actually start for example in my course as well uh, even in the modern novels of uh, uh, the novels of modern literature we actually started from uh, Goethe that is German literature and then now we are moving forward to uh, Arabic literature and then even Indian literature, uh, but we actually never talk about uh, the English. Uh, and in English, I mean the uh, UK uh, literature and the British literature, basically, and the American literature. We always talk about, even we are studying uh, literature of, um, I guess, Istanbul. So... Yes, Germans did. Yes, Germans did it first. Germans did everything first. So we actually start from there, that course, you know. So even I was mesmerized that because I have a big time love for Germany. So yes. Indian literature, what is the origin of this genre in India? Oh, my dear. I have no idea. The problem is I do not read Indian literature as much as I should because... Uh, I think this is the problem with most of the millennials. Uh, I was born in the 90s and till then a lot of uh, Western influence was already there in India and because of that and I've studied in a convent. So the problem is my Hindi is not better than my English and my English is not that great but my Hindi is not better than my English. So the problem is I read only English literature literature only in English language. I haven't been able to trace anything in Indian literature because most of it is in Sanskrit. And uh, so that is the problem, you know, but I am trying to find a good Sanskrit tutor because I really want to explore because I'm exploring German language as well. So I would definitely like to do it. But I, I but no, I do not have uh, an idea of uh, literature in India. Uh, it's sad, I know, but that's what modernization and westernization is, right? Okay, so moving on. In the 19th century, we also had some excellent, excellent, excellent other writers such as Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley and the brothers Grimm. And they are... Jacob and William Grimm, the German folklorist who published stories that included Hansel and Gretel and Snow White. And they have been, and I've actually read half of the Brothers Grimm stories and so many of the stories have been taken from them. You know, you would think that they were American uh, stories, but they are not and they have been taken from there. So in the 19th century, we had Brothers Grimm as well. Then we had Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein. Then we had Washington Irving's 
the legend of sleepy hollow now i'm pretty sure a lot of people might not have uh, read the book but Okay, you can see me. Okay, okay, I'm live. <laughs> It's working now. Okay, I'm so sorry for the interruption. God knows what happened. I have like two Wi-Fi's, but still. Anyway, so let's continue. Uh, we were on the 19th century, right? Then, <coughs> okay, let's move on to the 20th century. In the early 20th century, we had H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu Mythos. So, the beginning of the 20th century was really important for us horror enthusiasts because H.P. Lovecraft came out with his Cthulhu. Though, I would just like to go uh, on a side note and just share that H.P. Lovecraft was not able to publish significantly and uh, he actually did die of starvation which is just sad you know because he is today considered one of the best horror writers so H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu story it is like uh, the holy grail I would say you know It's like a jackpot for any horror writer. And now, uh, with that story, H.P. Lovecraft actually gave birth to a new genre of horror that is cosmic horror genre. Then, moving on, in the same time, during the same time, in the 20th century, there were a lot of famous works that focused on the sensationalized murders, murderers such as Jack the Ripper and many other less prominent ones. And then in 1959, Robert Bloch came up with Psycho. It's like a very, again, genre-defining work. Psycho came out in 1959. that is the mid 20th century again in the same century because 2019 and the 20th century are very prominent centuries for horror works then after that i guess someone just mentioned hannibal lecter in the comments and we are coming to that because the trend of slasher fiction picked up mostly because of the murders uh, of the mansion family the mansion family murders all of a sudden slasher horror fiction picked up and then we had the work of dr thomas harris uh, the works of dr thomas harris featuring the infamous dr hannibal lecter right then after that in the same century yes Okay, then H.P. Lovecraft again came up with stories that defined yet another subgenre of horror that is apocalyptic fiction and the stories were Cool Air in the Vault and The Outsider. This was followed by Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, the movie that most of the horror enthusiasts love. <coughs> then towards the end of late 20th century towards the end of 20th century that's the late 20th century three works were published that totally changed the game of horror genre and these three works are rosemary's baby by ira levin the exorcist by william peter blatty and the other by thomas tryon these three novels were the novels 
that actually popularized horror fiction so much that the mainstream publishers started taking it very seriously and then they started publishing and offering good publishing deals to horror writers and therefore this led to the rise of many contemporary horror writers that we have still amidst us such as Dean Koons, Dean Koons, Stephen King, Peter Straub and James Hobart. These are the authors that came out with their works in the end of 20th century. Now, I'm not going to talk about the 21st century because we are still... Uh, actually, 21st century is not that great for horror because we just have the works of the 19th century... Sorry, the 20th century uh, big authors. Uh, but not particularly excellent work still now we might get later on because we obviously have a lot of uh, years left for the century to get over so we'll see about that right now moving on we are going to see <coughs> these seven important elements of horror fiction Seven important elements of horror fiction. I'll first name them and then I'll tell you what they are, how they are defined and you know, we're going to talk about that. So the first one is suspense, fear, atmosphere, tension, motivations, stakes and anticipation. These are the seven most important elements in any horror work, okay? It doesn't matter what the subgenre is. It doesn't matter how you would like to categorize the book. But any novel that calls itself horror, and I'm talking about novel now, any novel that calls itself a horror has to have these seven important elements. Otherwise, the novel would not be that great. First one is suspense. Suspense is the tension a reader feels when they are not sure what will happen in a story. And obviously that is important in any horror novel. Next one is fear. Fear has a very wide range depending upon the writers as well as the readers, right? But basically it means invoking the response of fight or flight in the readers. If you are able to evoke that response from the reader, then you've scared them. That is fear. Next one is atmosphere. The feeling, emotion or mood that an author creates in a narrative, in a narrative through descriptive language and imagery is the atmosphere. So, atmosphere is not only created by settings, it is basically setting the mood for the reader. Then we have tension. Keeping a reader on the edge of their seat. That kind of emotional investment depends on stakes. That is the next point. <coughs> now, stakes and motivations, basically, I talk a lot about them in my workshops. But here I'm just covering the basics. Uh, because we have very limited time. So, stakes. It means ensuring the readers are invested in the characters and the outcome of the plot. Now, when we talk about character motivations, character motivation is basically how a character behaves. But when we talk about stakes, what it means is basically what will happen if the character doesn't behave a certain way or doesn't take a particular action. Uh, for example, if a hero or heroine protagonist is supposed to face a very evil creature. Okay, so he is supposed to do it, right? So we are going to introduce some motivations for that. There is a reason why they are going to do it. If they don't do it, 
what will happen so you have to raise the stakes in order for your character to feel justified in doing what he is doing he or she is doing and in order to invest your readers into the story but always remember whenever we are talking about motivations and stakes always deliver on the promises that you as a writer are making to the reader with the motivations and the stakes because there's nothing worse than a buzz it's like there's nothing worse than not being able to deliver the promises that an author makes especially when it comes to motivations and stakes so the seventh element is anticipation anticipation we all know anxiety and excitement and when we talk about horror i generally mean negative excitement in a negative way while waiting for an event a dreadful event to happen that is anticipation so these are the seven important elements of horror fiction that you will find in every horror story whether it is in the form of short stories in the form of long form fiction in the form of movies in television series anything documentaries even uh so these are the elements now moving on we are going to talk about the most famous or <laughs> as what i've done here is 13 common tropes now you all know the significance of 13 number and friday <laughs> so 13 common tropes used in horror fiction now okay let me just bring my presentation up to date yes 13 common tropes used in horror fiction before we begin i would like to share a big quote it is a big quote so just pay attention by stephen king <coughs> everyone has a very different definition of horror and terror so try not to get uh, too distracted by the terminologies the writers use uh, to try and understand the meaning of what they are trying to say okay so the three types of terror the gross out the sight of a severed head tumbling down a flight of stairs it's when the lights go out and something green and slimy splatters against your star against your arm the second one is the horror the unnatural spiders the size of bears the dead waking up and walking around it's when the lights go out and something with claws grabs you by the arm and the last and the worst one is terror when you come home and notice everything you own had been taken away and replaced by an exact substitute it's when the lights go out and you feel something behind you you hear it you feel its breath against your ear but when you turn around there's nothing there and that is how horror god stephen king defines the three types of terror now with that i'll jump into the tropes the 13 tropes the first one is jump scares now jump scares are actually a technique that is used in movies and series in the television medium uh but how do you do it in a novel because if we have to describe a jump scare it is described as an abrupt change in image or event usually occurring with a loud frightening sound so how do we get that sound from like where do we get that sound from because in novels we cannot unless it is an audiobook and you actually hire a very good audiobook recordist and you employ a lot of background music you actually cannot pull this off right but in writing as i see it it can be achieved by exciting or surprising the reader during a horrific or a horror situation by delivering either a major plot twist because it would be least expected then because you are already carrying the reader through a horror scene so they are not going to see it so either you employ quickly a major plot twist 
or a major reveal which will surprise the readers by catching them in the moment of discovery while already being in a horrific situation. Yes, and obviously, show don't tell technique, dear, has to be used everywhere in novels. If, like, I actually can't divulge a lot of details about it, but the thing is, if you're going to attend my workshop, I actually uh, talk a lot about show don't tell because it makes or breaks your novel. If you have a lot of telling, it's going to break your novel. If you're going to have a lot of showing, it's going to break your novel. You cannot have anything that is too much in a novel so you need to understand a balance between show and tell right because we need less of telling and more of showing and we also need to understand where to tell what to tell and what to show because you cannot show each and everything otherwise it kills the fun of showing so yes show don't tell does apply to it Right, we are going to talk about the characters. I'm just going to read the questions once after, after I finish this and then I'm going to answer all the questions, okay? So that was about jump scare. The second one is common tropes, abandoned places. Oh my God, you will find this in so many uh, works of horror and in different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean a big abandoned mansion it can be a graveyard a cemetery a small house uh, a dilapidated place a broken down place just a, a simple uh, abandoned setting of somewhere where people used to live so, uh, just an abandoned hut uh, I've used that one in my novel. So, there's so many things that you can do with an abandoned place trope, right? Why, and, and the thing is, abandoned places are obviously a big metonymy for morbidness. I'm going to talk about metonymy later. But abandoned places are obviously a very big metonymy for morbidness. And they also provide an excellent source for creating depressing settings. And that is what we want in horror, right? The next one is complex and flawed characters. Now, without going into a lot of details, I would just like to say, according to my school of thoughts, a novel has to have very strong story, plot line, and a very strong characterization. You cannot have either one of them. When you're building a horror story, most of the people focus on the story because they think story is the hero of the book. But no, if you want to learn anything, if you want to learn one thing from me, please let this be that one thing. You need to have strong characterization whether or not you consider your novel to be character based or story based story okay because the thing is a lot of people think that if they have a very good story they can actually get away with having a bland characterization and a lot of people think that if you know vice versa if they have very good characterization the story would be uh, not the main thing that people are going to notice but the thing is what happens is stories are always about characters stories and characters can never be separated and that is how I teach in all my webinars and all my classes and everything you know because you need to have strong characters and the one major flaw that most of the horror fiction has is that they do not concentrate enough on the characters they concentrate on the settings they concentrate on building up anticipation building up the dread building up the horror bringing in the terror and they concentrate a lot on the overall story but they don't concentrate enough on the characters and that, that's when the story totally falls flat on its face i cannot tell you how important characterization is therefore if you're writing a horror story strong characterization is must what does strong characterization mean okay i again i teach it in my workshop so 
uh, I cannot reveal a lot, but the thing is, what I would tell you is, they need to have a good character arc. You need to make sure which arc you are using for your character. You need to have solid background stories for all your characters. You need to have very strong character motivations and stakes. And I'm talking here about personal stakes as well as uh, their stakes in the overall context of the story. And fourth is you need to build solid character profile sheets for your each and every character, but especially your main character. That's how you build a strong, strong characterization uh, character. But when I talk about characterization, I am not only talking about the main character. I'm also talking about the side characters and the secondary characters and the flat characters. So. Characterization. So you need to have well-rounded characters. Okay. The next one is Omnia settings. It instantly gives the creeps to the readers, aiding you to build anticipation of doom. Next, unexpected and sometimes senseless twists. Now the thing is, twists are good, but most of the horror fiction, if you are going to go and watch random horror movies, you'll find or random horror novels, you'll find a lot of senseless twists and I'm totally against it if you are going to learn it from me do not have senseless twists in your horror it would be better to have just five six uh, minor twists than have 20 I would say cheap and you know senseless uh, uh, twists because it's a cheap technique that writers or a shortcut that writers use in order to engage their readers but it's actually wrong okay then we have traumatic past events. Traumatic past events. When I say traumatic past events, I'm not only referring to the characters. It can also be applied to settings, to the place you are using for building up your atmosphere and the mood. Because everything has a history. And adding history would go a long way in creating strong characterization and very strong settings. Then we have unrevealed secrets. Now, unrevealed secrets are basically used through foreshadowing, which I'm going to talk about. But unrevealed secrets are basically when someone's hiding something, that is the best way to evoke anticipation and suspense because then we know what they're hiding is of great importance and that is going to change the game whenever the, that reveal comes, right? Then unreliable narrator. Un unreliable narrator sorry it is very difficult to pull off but if done well it is very easy and convenient to create suspense and uncertainty in your novel then we have gore gore is basically a shortcut to gross out your readers <coughs> and make them squirm in their seats then we have demon or evil spirit or a monster in the attic or the basement or the walls or the protagonist's head self-explanatory right then we have found footage found footage is basically applied in writing through epistolary chapters so found footage then the 12th one is lurking evil evil that lurks you cannot see it but you can just feel it and only the protagonist can feel it right the main character can feel it now when i say the main character it can actually be a side character as well it depends on which character we are talking about uh, who feels the lurking evil then we have mirror scare now mirror scare is something that has been used time and again in horror <coughs> the mirror's potential link with the supernatural is what gives it so much power and also you can also use this mirror scare in the sense that a lot of people are phobic of reflections and that can be used in a psychological way very nicely. So that was the 13th point. Now, I really need to take a break of two minutes because I just need to stand and walk for a minute. So I am going to take a short break. After coming back, before beginning, I'll be answering all the questions. Okay, so I'll just go through the questions in the break. Uh, and then we'll be going ahead and discussing uh, the next bits, okay? So we are going to take, let's take two minute break, okay? Two minutes only. 
So I'll see you after two minutes. Please do not go anywhere. Just hang around here only, okay? Just two minutes. Uh, okay, be right back. Hey Margie, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Okay, I'm just gonna go through the questions. So just give me a minute and then uh, we'll begin. Okay, so I'm back. 
Hello, I'm gonna answer the questions now before we go ahead because then there will be a lot of questions otherwise. Okay, so it, Hiten has said that sometimes, uh, just a second, I'll just close the screen. Yes. Sometimes even psychological thrillers are misinterpreted for horror. Yes, they are. I have no idea why they do it. But generally, I would say it is because I said, you know, the definition of horror is pretty uh, open to interpretation and pretty loose. So it actually depends on the ratio of anticipation and, you know, the mystery and the suspense because suspense is one of the main elements of horror genre. So what happens is if it has uh, like this is ratio, right? So if they have a certain amount of suspense, it's like totally full of suspense, then they actually categorize it as horror, which is actually a, I find it a little misleading, uh, but they do it. So yes, can sublime be understood as a part of horror? Sublime, I would say, yes, if it has most of the horror elements, then yes, because see what happens is, in stories, always remember, you never have one particular theme. You always have multiple themes, right? What defines the genre are the first three to four main themes, the main concepts that you're trying to deliver and the main uh, elements that you're trying to use in your novel. That is what defines the genre. So sublime, yes, if it is accompanied by other elements that are important in uh, fiction. Uh, sorry, horror fiction, right? Uh, it was the question, it was questioned by Anjali. Now, Bharat, just you compare this topic to example movies we easily understand. Yes, I, I will be doing it. I'm actually going to discuss works of uh, fiction, movies and novels. So we are going to do it in that. Right? But you have any questions, you please uh, post them here so that I can give you an example because there are like, so many examples are there in my head. So it's actually pretty difficult to just segregate them right? Like, in such a little time. right? Uh, then Ashish has asked, these stories were part of 14th century European literature or they collected. Okay, right. I answered that. Hiten. Oh my God, Hannibal Lecter, The Silence of the Lambs. Yes, that's so good. Both the books and the film. Yes, they were very good. Anjali, what about the folklore revolving around paganism in Africa cultures? Right, African cultures. But the problem is, see, if we are going to talk about paganism, I guess it would come under the religious, uh, uh, the texts inspired by the religion because paganism was something that was uh, uh, practiced by a lot of people, right? So it would actually uh, come under occult as well. Maybe not even in a completely negative sense. But uh, yes, uh, so it would, uh, I don't know exactly which century it would uh, be allotted to because it would depend upon when Africans uh, had that kind of uh, uh, the, the paganism, right? So yes, but in relation to the most famous works, when we are talking about literature, we tend to take only the most popular works that define uh, a particular genre or a particular type of literature, right? So paganism, I would say, has not particularly defined uh, literature so much, even uh, if we are talking about horror. That's why it is not, you know, given that much weightage or why we talk about horror literature in general. Uh, then we have a question from Anjali. Yes, yes, you can totally use paganism as a, a part of a horror novel. It would actually give a lot of good uh, uh, things to work on in a horror novel. Uh, being a women writer wasn't given the credit for it. Yes, Anjali, I actually agree with you because that was pretty misogynistic of them to think Horace Walpole was the inventor of gothic fiction when in reality Anne Radcliffe was. So I do agree with you. What about, okay, this is Bharat. What about mythological horror? I already answered that, right? It would be with the religious texts of the uh, Roman and the Greeks. So, 14th century. Then Ashish. So, German did it first. Yes, German did everything first. Then we have Bindu. 
What about horror genre in English literature? I already answered that. I do not know about Indian literature a lot, but I will definitely do research now. And once I have enough material, I will definitely share it with you all. Uh, Sharmila. Sharmila, you retracted your message. You want to share? You can share. It's okay. I'll, answer, I'll try to answer if I can. The horror literature, Ashish. The horror literature I've seen in India was portrayed so badly by Bollywood. I've dropped the idea of reading Indian horror literature. Okay, now Indian horror literature I haven't read, so I do not have a lot of idea. Though I do think if Mr. Vikram Divan is here, he is actually a Hindi horror writer. I gathered uh, as much from his Instagram profile. So if he is here, uh, sir, if you would like to answer this question, we would really appreciate because I would really like to know his point of view because he writes in the language right but I do agree with you Ashish because Indian horror flicks are really 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 they just use the bad tricks the cheap tricks and the shortcuts and then they make really bad horror movies <coughs> actually that was the reason you know one of the uh, literary agencies in Bombay was actually interested in a uh, uh, series OTT adoption, uh, sorry, adaption of screen adaptation of the scene, my first novel. And they were actually hunting a lot of uh, studios and production houses. But I was so skeptical about it because I really knew that if these guys take it, they might just ruin my book, you know. <laughs> I know that's weird to think about, but uh, I actually had a lot of problem with a lot of things. So uh, he's still hunting the appropriate production house for me but yes they actually ruin horror and thrillers okay then okay question 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 Hitain, 20th century silence of the lambs alfred hitchcock's classic exhausted rosemary's baby i am legend stephen king uh stanley kubrick yes that is one name i forgot who is the century the best story yes 20th century is actually best for horror it's actually best for a lot of lit other literature as well then Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street are not to mention Friday the 13th. Yes, yes, they are. But they are actually kind of movies. Nightmare on the Elm Street is actually a novel adaptation, right? Uh, I do have to check it out. But yes, they should be included in the slasher. As I said, slasher was uh, just at the beginning, you know, because of the mansion uh, murders. Uh, so yes, that time everything picked up. Uh, related to slasher genre so i think it can be achieved by plant planting a character who is dead or something unexpected that happens to mc ashish yes ashish yes that can, that is how uh, we do jump scares in writing uh hitain sometimes a bad director or storyteller ruins an extremely amazing story hitain yes that is the thing Sometimes the story is good, but the writing is bad. Sometimes the writing is good. The story is not great. Sometimes characterization is bad, so everything falls flat, you know. Then Marjorie, yes. Can you explain more about unreliable character? Yes, Marjorie. And here, I guess I would answer someone else's question as well, who wanted, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the name. I guess Bharat wanted uh, examples, right, uh, from literature. So what I'm going to say is for unreliable narrator, the best example of unreliable narrator would be in classics, I would say, because I'm not sure about if you've read the contemporary ones or not. But for unreliable narrator, I can actually go on uh, because like for an entire day, because I've been working on an unreliable narrator from last five years, you know, my main protagonist. So <coughs> an unreliable narrator uh, the perfect example is The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And I would say, do consider and uh, do pay attention because a lot of people, a lot of readers were actually not able to pick up on it that uh, the governess in The Turn of the Screw was actually an unreliable narrator. You take her age in consideration because when you're talking about unreliable narrator, I, I broadly, I would say, I'm not going to go in detail because we're actually running short of time. But when we have unreliable narrator, one is an outright unreliable narrator, which the readers instantly know that they are an unreliable narrator. So whatever they are saying may be true, may not be true, right? Uh, for example, if we have a person 
uh, for whom a lot of people are just saying that they hear things and uh, they are not to be trusted you know so somewhere I know outright we are not going to believe that they might be an unreliable narrator because they might actually be the protagonist of the story but somewhere or the other the author plants this doubt in the minds of the reader that the narrator might just be unreliable so whatever they are saying you will always have an alternate uh, thought be, uh, be at, at the back of your head that maybe it's not like that maybe they're just crazy or maybe they're just generally unreliable narrators are either liars manipulators which generally generally do not tend to take as uh, <coughs> protagonists uh, unless you are working in a negative arc but most of the time they are uh, the psychologically affected characters the emotionally uh, let's say imbalanced character or characters with uh, uh, solid mental health issues right because what happens then it's not necessary if a person has mental health health issues. I have, so no offense to anyone. So if a person has mental health issues, they are prone to feeling a lot more than other people, right? So they are very intuitive. They are very receptive on an emotional level as well as on a psychological level and uh, maybe on a cosmic level as well. So what happens is then you have one an outright... Uh, what I was uh, outright unreliable narrator and the other one is the example that I gave of the turn of the screw you actually read about uh, the story from the point of the view of the governess and there are very subtle hints that a lot of people actually don't even pick up on where it is pointed out that the narrator is unreliable so that is a very subtle kind of way of having an unreliable narrator where most of the readers might not even pick up on uh, the narrator being an unreliable narrator until it's very late either or maybe never. <coughs> so there are two ways of doing it, broadly speaking. Then we have, uh, yes, unreliable. I like you. Thank you, Marge. For her. Yes, I actually worked a lot on this uh, software, you know. So yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, Va uh, Van, we have Van22, I don't know the name, so I'm just saying uh, the username. Anyone have any recommendations for a person just starting to read horror fiction? Yeah, sure, I think everyone's answered, but I will also uh, recommend you, that basically depends on what kind of other stories you read. Uh, so, you know, I would say... If you are not into a lot of horror uh, and if you say it's very difficult because I really don't want to scare you uh, like uh, outright but if you want to go for a mild horror first that's what I would recommend if you're starting with horror genre. I would recommend something if you like apocalyptic then you can go for sell by Stephen King. I would always recommend Stephen King for horror fans but if you really want to get scared and frightened then I would definitely recommend 77 Shadow Street by Dean Koontz. It's a pretty scary book or if you can handle it I doubt you might be because you're new to horror fiction then the women in black. It's actually pretty good. Okay. <coughs> I will definitely share a link of more books because they, like I'm just saying from the top of my mind you know uh, I'll just have a look and then I'll uh, uh, share more books that I've read if you use or inspired by some concepts from 16th to 19th century and write oh yes I am very much inspired by a lot of classic works because I read this book uh, Armadale Armadale by Wilkie Collins that is a very good gothic novel if you like it and it's actually a revenge saga and it's a very long book I am very much inspired by most of the classics that I've read and I do not like Jane Eyre and uh, uh, the common classics that we tend to read in India I don't even like Shakespeare's uh, plays so I read very different kind of fiction so if you would like my recommendations you can actually go to my goodreads and just see my shelf you know I always shelf the books that I read so I do get my inspirations from them uh, <coughs> but in the end you have to go with your original ideas right so yes is that legal getting inspired by things is legal yes you are not plagiarizing Plagiarism is not legal. It is illegal copying someone's work. 
never someone like me can never even copy because i just have so many stories to tell by myself that i can never copy i actually find a lot of fault i'm i am a a uh, manuscript critic by profession so i do find a lot of flaws in even the classics right that's how i get my inspiration that oh my god they did this but actually it should have been this way and then from there my thoughts take off in another direction you know because then the entire thing changes so that's how you get inspired being inspired is different copying is different you cannot copy and get away with it never not in this age remember not in this age you can never copy and get away with anything <laughs> or do we need to take any permissions from previous publishers oh uh, you cannot use someone's work outright see now there is a concept of writing retellings a lot of people do retellings but if it is an extremely famous work you can just mention it in your work that it is a retelling of certain work for example i'll tell you i'll show you an example actually uh this is monsters by uh sharon dogger right this book is actually the retelling of the life of mary shelley herself how she came to write frankenstein it is a beautiful book it is a beautiful beautiful book and uh, i think yes you need to take permissions especially from the country you are taking the authors from because if they are famous authors then i'm pretty sure the countries like you have to take permissions but i am not into retellings and i'm not into fan fiction i'm sorry if you are into it but uh, yes generally if you go for fan fiction uh, there is a lot of fan fiction for hp lovecraft and it's actually called uh, cthulhu mythos and lovecraftian worlds so you can write influenced like retellings of those worlds i don't do it when i say i feel inspired by the writings that i read the books that i read i say it in a very different sense because it jumps starts my own imagination i don't actually retell stories because uh, again i just have a very over active imagination and i have a problem of um, uh, having a lot of stories in my head so i don't do it and i would say uh, getting inspired is okay copying is never okay even if you take permission like don't go for retellings outright unless you really love that author for example i'm pretty sure if sharon dogger has done it she really loved mary shelley right that's how then she can do it nicely because i think there are a lot of books on mary shelley's life herself because she was the author uh, daughter of a very famous author wife of a very famous author so yes the next one is can i get more book suggestions yes yes sure i'll give you dear i'll give you uh, just uh, let's just finish the webinar and then i'll give you a lot of suggestions for the books and i would love to attend other webinars not only horror now join them as well sure you can join them you just follow me on my uh, social media and i generally post about all my webinars there and the upcoming workshops as well thanks a lot marjay i'm 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 so happy that you like the idea of unreliable narrator i'm pretty uh, marjay is actually a author everyone so she writes fantasy she writes amazing fantasy and i was uh i had the great opportunity to be able to work with her on one of her books the second book uh, in her series i critiqued it and she is going to be publishing it soon so she is a very good writer um i mean to say extension to the previous concepts extension again i would say uh, ram chandran do not go for extension i would say rather write your own story right see what i strongly and firmly believe in and what i always tell all my students whether or not they like it is do not try to write a long form fiction story if you do not have a burning idea in your head right so if you think i like some work and i really want to write some extension of it write a blog post write a short story and publish it on your blog that is that that means you're not selling it right so you can do it as a kind of dedication i would strongly suggest against going for extensions and retellings at this point in your careers because uh for example if i have to do a retelling of something i would actually never do it right i am actually against fan fiction as well because fan fiction is okay till the time you are publishing it on your blogs and free but fan fiction is actually not good or not okay if you are 
publishing it because people do get publishing deals for fan fiction and I am from a very traditionalist sort of uh, 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 school of thoughts you know so I agree with George R. R. Martin because a writer puts a lot of effort into writing a book and when you write fan fiction you actually do not get how the writer came up with that idea and you just build up on that idea right so do not go for extensions uh, Ramachandran I would suggest if you want to do it as a kind of practice yes you can as writing exercises I always tell my students to uh, try and recreate a scene that they really like from some novel or try and recreate a story that they really like in some novel or a short story or some movie so as practice exercises extension and retelling is okay uh, but uh, not for publishing and not especially for long form fiction because how can you work on something for so long uh, like you'll have to write around 80, 60, 80,000 words of it how can you write an extension over something like that because you are not you will never be fully invested into it unless you are that, and that, those are exceptions right okay so I guess I just <laughs> I just spoke about it a lot okay so let us uh, move on and finish our uh, webinar I think we have um, a lot of topics left so yes now plot structures used in horror fiction <coughs> now plot structures is something okay no problem Ramchandra I hope I cleared your doubt because I, I do feel strongly about it. That's why I discussed it in length. Uh, but you can obviously do it as an exercise and a dedication, right? So, yeah. Plot structures. Now, plot structures is the biggest selling point for me for my workshops. Because I teach uh, plot structures which are uh, actually not taught in most of the classes. Uh, so, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with plot structures because if you want to learn, you will have to join my workshop then. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but I am going to discuss the main things that you have to keep in mind when you are deciding or creating the plot structure for your horror novel. Just a second. Okay. So, when we talk about plot structures, I always, always suggest sticking to the basic plot structure that is <coughs> first is a pyramid uh, structure that is the beginning middle and end and second one is three act plot structure but the problem is three act plot structure is just so simple that a lot of people get stuck in the between sorry in the section that comes in between because in three act plot structure what happens is your novel is divided into 25% 50% and 25% three sections okay so in the middle you have a section of a big lump of section of 50% and that is the main problem in novels the middle section is not good so what I would say is whenever you're working on a story first of all always work out the beginning then the ending and then later on, after the you figured out the ending, you need to work on the middle section. And then we divide the middle section into more acts. So I would say go for a five act structure instead. In five act structure, it's basic. We divide the three act structure into three more into three more parts. So you total have a five act plot structure. So <coughs> we'll use a five act plot structure. You can find the three act and the four act on my blog under resources. I also have two videos on three act and four act structure, I guess. So you can watch them if you want to learn about them. But generally we use that. <coughs> okay, you saw the reflection of one of my cat babies. Yes, they keep on running behind <laughs> on the stairs. Okay, another plot structure that I would suggest is the nine act plot structure that I actually teach in my class. I'm not going to go in detail, but I'm just going to show you a graph because uh, I'm not trying to sell my class. <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you the reversal. So this is the nine act plot structure and here we have a reversal. Okay, so when we are talking about plot structures in horror, I strongly feel that we need a negative reversal okay now I know do not worry if you don't get it 
plot structures are anyway complex and i think most of you are beginners so you don't have to worry yourself a lot with plot structures right now <coughs> they come into play when you're working on your second draft so leave it for that that time you can learn about them later but when we are talking about plot structures for horror fiction i usually use five act plot structure for the main plot storyline and i do use the nine plot act structures reversal but in a negative way that is i give a false resolution and then it's generally recommended to give a false resolution and then go for the reversal and then have a climax and then have a very short resolution in the end the true resolution so that the second thing that you need to keep in mind while working on plot structures for horror fiction is the tension graph because the story graph in horror fiction is not as important it is important but not as important as the tension graph for tension graph i would highly suggest the fichtian curve the fichtian curve right again that is something that i teach in my workshop but for now just keep it in mind because it has a lot of curves and valleys uh hills and valleys it has a lot of curves it is like this you know like a heartbeat so you have a lot of ups and downs and those ups and downs are of crisis so you have a lot of crisis and then you have a resolution of those crisis then you have another crisis and you have resolution of those crisis so what happens in sorry so what happens is in a horror story your protagonist is constantly in the state of action and reaction action and reaction right because uh the antagonist whatever monster you have can be a physical entity can be a spiritual entity can be a demon can be a monster or can be a psychological factor or an emotional factor only you know so that antagonist whatever it is will be throwing curve balls towards your protagonist therefore keeping your protagonist in a constant motion of action and reaction action and reaction and that's how we form the scenes so what happens is you need to pay attention to the tension graph of your novel okay <coughs> another thing is that you need to keep a track of the trajectory of the fear because if you go wrong in the trajectory of fear you're going to lose the plot entirely in horror fiction then we are going to yes we spoke about inverted reversal then trajectory of fear generally if i have to name uh, the scale of fear or uh, horror <coughs> in a horror novel i according to me because it can vary from writer to writer and reader to reader but for me it would be revulsion unease slow burn false leads dread horror terror relief false false relief climax and then proper relief the catharsis right so the thing is you need to use these elements properly in a particular order uh, to create a proper trajectory of fear <coughs> also uh, for the plot structures you can actually go for the in media res but again i really don't want to confuse you guys with the plot structures because it is a complex topic and it needs a session of its own right so yes so that was about plot structures uh, for horror fiction uh, now we are going to talk about let us see what we have next popular horror subgenres yes uh, let me just open my own ppt yes there are so many sub genres of each and every genre right so for horror also we have a lot of sub genres and we are going to talk about them so let us look at the popular horror sub genres now i think a lot of people's questions would be answered here because <coughs> now we are going to talk about the sub genres so we have gothic horror supernatural horror now gothic horror is i'm going to talk about gothic horror for another 5 minutes but after this topic supernatural horror paranormal horror 
Now, what is the difference in supernatural horror and paranormal horror? Can anyone say? Are you guys there? Because I haven't been seeing comments from a long time. So, do reply with whatever interpretation of you have of supernatural and paranormal. And then I will tell you the difference between the two. Then we have psychological horror, slasher horror. Science fiction horror, which is basically speculative horror, right? <coughs> uh, can you guys see me now? It's buffering. Gobin is children. I have no idea what happened. What was the last thing? Okay, yeah. Yes, okay, science fiction horror. When we are talking about science fiction horror, uh, it is actually named as speculative fiction yes okay so science fiction horror is basically speculative fiction speculative fiction is a very good uh, subgenre of horror so if you like horror fiction do check out uh, speculative fiction works because they are really good one such example of speculative fiction is mary shelley's frankenstein right so science fiction is speculative fiction uh, then we have horror fiction sorry comedy horror uh, Again, I'm not a fan of comedy horror. Then we have horror retellings. Then we have ghost stories. Occult horror. Post-apocalyptic or apocalyptic horror. Dark fantasy. Lovecraftian horror. Surreal horror, right? So, surreal or sublime horror. Body horror or medical horror. It's like a horrible horror because it's very hard to read. Uh, especially for me because I'm averted to the body horror thing. Space horror, monster or creature horror, religious horror. Okay, so you guys need a definition, or uh, you guys generally want to talk about any other fiction except for gothic fiction because gothic fiction is something I'm going to discuss now. So if you uh, want to talk about something, then please do let me know. Now we are going to go ahead and talk a little bit in detail about gothic fiction. Now when we say gothic fiction, there are a couple of elements and I have a list of 8 to 10 elements that gothic fiction needs. So I'm just going to talk about them. <coughs> Let me know if you want a clarification or definition of something and I'll explain it to you. The first element of gothic fiction is old mansion or castle. They often include secret rooms, trap doors, hidden passages, trick panels, hidden staircases, decaying greenhouses or outhouses, you know. So these kind of things always help in building a lot of suspense because they provide you with a lot of settings that can be used for good atmosphere. Then they also invoke a sense of claustrophobia and fear. That is always, you know, you can always have a lurking evil in a very abandoned place and that will set up a great stage for your horror novel or horror scene. Second one is ancient prophecy. Ancient prophecy or some kind of, uh, <coughs> uh, what do we call it? Some kind of... Uh, uh, prophecy left by either the um, ancestors or uh, some uh, traditionalist people of the town or something like that you know so it always adds another element to the gothic fiction then we have visions there are always visions then we have omens then we have unexplainable events happening in those abandoned places then we have amplified emotions the protagonists especially females in these novels in the goth novels we always 
Okay, I, I, oracles know I meant omens. <laughs> okay, so yes. Yes, oracle, you can use oracle. Okay, then uh, amplified emotions for generally for females because they are more receptive, they are more emotionally uh, prone uh, to what do you call it, you know, the presence that is around. So that's how they depict. So gothic will gothic fiction will always have some female protagonist who has uh, basically intensified emotion or intensified emotional responses to uh, even the little things uh, that unsettle them, you know. So the next one is atmosphere of suspense and mystery, the constant atmosphere of suspense and mystery. That is a must in any gothic novel or story. <coughs> Then we use imagery a lot for dark, darkness and dankness in that abandoned place. So everything revolves around the abandoned place basically in gothic fiction. Then we have thick, thick, intense vocabulary that invokes this crazy sense of anticipation and doom and dread in the hearts of the readers. So this is all uh, that makes up gothic fiction. Now... We are going to go ahead and talk about the literary devices, the literary devices or tools used in horror fiction. Now pay close attention because literary devices are kind of important for all writers whether, you, whether or not you are <coughs> uh, writing horror fiction, okay. So, literary devices are obviously very important. Uh, Ritam has a question. No, no. I wanted to mean oracles as in context of ancient prophecy. Yes, you can use oracles in context of ancient prophecy. Ancient prophecy, when I say you can actually use anything. And uh, I guess even someone asked me about the paganism in Africa, right? So, you can actually use it in ancient prophecy uh, bit or uh, something like that, you know. Okay, so moving on, we have eight literary devices. Sorry, uh, sorry, it, it's not eight, it's five. I forgot to change the number. I was actually going to discuss eight, but it's already almost two hours. So we are going to talk about only five literary devices because simile and metaphor, like we, everyone knows about them. So uh, we're going to talk about these in particular. So we have foreshadowing, onomatopoeia, hyperbole and metonymy and dramatic irony. Now I am going to discuss one by one each and every literary device and I am going to give you an example also of them. So pay, pay close attention to it. Okay. Now foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is a literary device in which a writer gives an advance hint of what is to come later in the story. Foreshadowing often appears at the beginning of a story but not necessarily. It can also be at the beginning of a chapter or a beginning of a scene. Okay, And it helps the readers develop expectations from the upcoming events. But again, always make sure that if you are uh, promising something to your readers, raising their expectations, always deliver on those expectations and always, always deliver on your promises as a writer. <coughs> so the example of foreshadowing is <clears throat> when Sonia's alarm clock woke her at 9 o'clock that morning, she had no idea that today would be the longest day of her life. Right? So that is foreshadowing. Then we have onomatopoeia. A word that phonetically imitates, resembles or suggests the sound it describes. Such a word itself is called as onomatopoeia. Now, examples are she heard the creak of the floorboards, the whooshing of the winds woke him up in the middle of the night, the bang of the door or on the door. Okay. Then, hyperbole, the use of exaggeration 
as a literary device as a figure of speech is known as hyperbole it emphasizes evokes strong feelings and creates strong emotions and impressions as a figure of speech it is usually not meant to be taken literally okay for example deep grief intense distaste dark gloom okay these are examples of hyperbole now hyperbole is generally uh, used uh, by basically there's a trick uh, of using hyperboles in your novel uh, when you have to use hyperboles just use very strong adjectives before your nouns that are important because when you use strong adjectives what happens is you are emphasizing on the noun itself and you are making or uh making the readers realize that the noun that you're talking about is important is of some importance and therefore uh they will be alerted to its presence right that's why we use hyperbole actually in the first place so hyperbole then the next one is dramatic irony now ironies are actually of four type cosmic irony uh situational irony uh dramatic irony and verbal irony uh but in horror fiction we generally use dramatic irony a lot we do use other kinds of ironies as well but <coughs> here i'm discussing the top 5 literary devices you know from top to bottom so dramatic irony now <coughs> dramatic irony is basically when the audience uh, audience knows something that the characters don't for example i'll give you a very 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 simple example and if you guys are able to hear me please leave some uh, comment because i'm not able to see comments i haven't seen comments in the last i guess five something minutes so i'm just not sure if you guys are able to see me or not so please just comment something so that i'll know so uh, dramatic irony is basically when the audience knows something that the characters don't know about so what happens is when we watch titanic movie and uh, your character leans over the rails of the ship and uh, says that the view is just so beautiful that they can die that's dramatic irony because you know they are going to die you know the ship is going to sink uh, thank you ramchandran thank you so much yes thank you rhythm uh, yes okay so that is dramatic irony okay then we have metonymy in a metonymy i have i guess i have been using this word since the start of the webinar metonymy is basically a sub type of uh, metaphor metonymy enables writers to express a word or thought in a different way by using a closely related word or thought in metonymy one object or idea takes the place of another with which it has a close association with for example <coughs> in general if i'm talking about then rain stands for sorrow uh winds howling winds stand for uh, bad news then crows the bird crow crows stand for something unpleasant so these are metonymies right so these are the five main literary elements that we use in horror fiction <coughs> obviously we use other uh, literary devices as well uh, it's the more literary devices you use the better unless you are really overdoing them but that's how it is right so now we are going to see what is next now famous works of fiction now we are going to discuss some works that i already told you about but as it is time i am just going to quickly cover these so if you want uh, or have any doubts or want to know about uh, uh something in particular then just let me know okay i'm just going to increase the size of my screen uh, so that i'm nicely visible to you okay so now okay so now i'm going to talk about the yellow wallpaper now please tell me how many of you actually read the yellow wallpaper uh it's okay if you read it before earlier or just before the webinar for the webinar 
because I really wanted you guys to read the yellow wallpaper because it's a very significant work in psychological uh, horror genre. <coughs> okay, great, great, great. I hope you guys, other, others have also read it, right? Because if not, then do read it, okay? Now, I'm going to discuss the main, I'm going to basically just state the four main themes that have been used, the elements that have been used in uh, the yellow wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, right? First is mental illness of the protagonist. Second is resting cure. Now, yes, yes, it, it is gothic, it is gothic because it has uh, a kind of abandoned place which the narrator actually wanted it to be haunted but it was not so she just created something out of her mind right now resting cure i would like to talk to you about it uh resting cure is something that was pretty common in the olden times and it was generally prescribed by uh, a lot of doctors in general because earlier we did not have psychiatrists or psychologists so it was uh, prescribed or told to practice yes so it was uh, prescribed to a lot of people, especially women uh, who were prone to hysteria because that was a very sad thing in the olden times. So they had this resting cure in which they told a person who was uh, kind of going through a hysterical phase to just rest, right? Now the problem is the author herself was recommended a resting cure by her uh, doctor and in this novel, through this novel, she tried to explain what the resting cure can actually uh, do to a person who has an overactive imagination. How destructive uh, the resting cure can be for someone who needs to who either needs medication or who need either needs a, a proper uh, treatment for their condition, right? So when the protagonist was uh, given the resting cure, she wasn't allowed to work by her husband, right? Because her husband was a physician, the doctor. Uh, even her brother was a doctor, right? Big doctor. So they told her to just rest, not do anything. And what happened was that led to her that totally fueled her imagination basically because whenever she saw the yellow wallpaper whenever she entered that room she was able to see something in the patterns and then ultimately it led to her losing herself to insanity that is one of the other elements that is used in the novel so in fact after this novel uh, the author's doctor actually apologized to her <laughs> for uh, uh, telling her uh, to rest while she needed treatment so yes another thing that is used is obviously the gothic settings and the upsetting settings you know the gloomy settings <coughs> then that was about the yellow wallpaper the next one in line is the woman in black I am not sure how many of you have uh, uh, read The Woman in Black. I haven't read the book. I have heard, listened to the audio book. And that was really very, very, very creepy. And it took me a lot of, a very long time to uh, read, to listen to the book. Because I watched the movie earlier. But the movie was nowhere as close to what the book was. Yes, Ritam, I agree with you. I agree with you about the writing. The writing was obviously fantastic. Actually, her other books, her other uh, novels and short stories are also actually pretty well written. Uh, even people with asparagus syndrome get uneasy in the presence of yellow color. Right. See, so what is needed is cure right the treatment at least you know because if we don't have a cure we at least need the treatment the right treatment we cannot just ask someone to just rest or take it easy or just chill you know that's what the author is basically trying to say even the sequel to the women in black yes okay so i'm talking about the women in black now it has again an isolated place it is a mansion it is a proper mansion then there are supernatural forces in this one 
scary supernatural forces then one of the main central themes is revenge although it was revealed later on but it was a very significant theme in air revenge then we have morbid curiosity morbid curiosity you know and there is this phrase that i do not like i'm not going to say it but curiosity is not that great especially when you see it find it or put it in a protagonist in a horror novel so that was what uh henry james so, sorry henry james susan hill did in the women in black so it was just morbid curiosity right then we have rosemary's baby actually if you haven't read rosemary's baby i would highly recommend reading rosemary's baby i would also recommend watching rosemary's baby movie because it does go uh pretty it is very fast paced because there's just so much to cover but it is a pretty near perfect adaptation of the book right so it's very good in <coughs> rosemary's baby we have seemingly perfect life psychological manipulation and isolation okay and i'm not going to discuss the details because i really don't want to spoil the book for you but these are the major themes that were used the elements that were used occult and satanism then we have acceptance of morbid reality now acceptance of morbid reality is again in itself a very morbid a horrific terrific thing to do like uh, terrorizing thing to do because once you accept the morbid reality what else is left you cannot be saved right you know it's wrong but you just accept it oh yes i know priests don't like a lot of things they don't like uh, dan brown's books as well what can we do anyway so the next book the last book i guess i would like to talk about is the turn of the screw by henry james in the turn of the screw we have again an isolated place and a very young character who shouldn't be placed in that isolated place who is put in that isolated place then we again have supernatural forces then there are two different things that i want to talk about now again there are a lot of themes in all these works i'm just talking about the main ones that i want to talk about right the main ones that i want to highlight unreliable narrator okay the turn of the screw has unreliable narrator in the form of the governess and the fourth one is misplaced loyalties now why misplaced loyalties is because the motivation of the governess for taking good care of the children was kind of not because she had loyalties or uh, a uh, great 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 love for the children but it was actually because she liked the which was very lightly hinted it was never uh, revealed as such but it was pretty uh, clearly hinted that she liked the uh, uncle of the children and she wanted to impress him that's why she hid the letter of the expulsion of Uh, miles from school and she refused to you know involve the uncle because he already gave her the instructions plus she wanted to create a good impression so misplaced loyalties is something that was used in henry james book so these are the things that were used in the book now uh i guess that was all i really wanted to cover i actually wanted to discuss uh, the haunting of hell house as well but uh, again if we look at all the elements all the elements were used in the haunting of hill house and haunting of hill house is good the book is a lot different from the series but the series has done a pretty good job the haunting of bly manor is not that great i do like the turn of the screw a lot better than uh, the haunting of bly manor but the haunting of hill house is something that everyone should watch especially if you want to write horror fiction uh because it will teach you a lot about creating suspense and having good characterization most of all <coughs> so haunting of hill house the novel is also great i love it and there are a lot of people who actually don't like that book because uh of its ending maybe but i really like it i loved it actually so that's another recommendation from me 
now <coughs> i would just like to uh, end uh, the webinar by asking you if you have any questions uh, about whatever we spoke about today whatever i spoke about today or uh, if you need some clarifications or anything of the sort if yes then please just let me know i'm just gonna share the details of the workshop that i have planned for uh... <coughs> okay uh, just give me a second and i'll just open the details and let you guys know i actually didn't want to burden you all earlier before the webinar because I know I even I hate webinars that promote a lot of stuff but uh, I just wanted to let you know about the workshops because a lot of people are actually interested in the workshop uh, they told me that they wanted to uh, take part in the workshop that's why I thought I'll just uh, share it so first I'm going to share the details of fiction writing for beginners workshop uh, it is a two-day workshop right and uh, the sessions are going to be two to three hours each day. I generally, now you might have understood, I generally have a tendency to talk very passionately about writing. So I do go, it might just go till four hours. So uh, I try to keep them within three hours, but it might just go. That is if the students really want to discuss something after the class. <coughs> On day one, I will be teaching the following topics, please pay close attention because I forgot to add the images here so I'm just gonna share the details here the first day would be creative writing and fiction writing basics and getting started in writing and the topics are introduction to creative writing forms of creative writing introduction to fiction writing forms of fiction writing various divisions of fiction based on audience and genre further division of fiction genres according to content and audience age groups, discovering the writer within, learning the best approach for writing that suits your aptitude and way of living, the four ways of writing and finding the best one for you, where to start writing, that is how to write and what to write, how to find the right ideas and inspiration for writing, how to start working on those ideas, how to develop those ideas, important terminologies in creative writing and fiction writing and important literary devices and their execution this is day one of fiction writing for beginners day two of fiction writing of beginners would be about writing fiction and dealing with the problems and the topics would include elements of fiction writing tools of fiction writing point of views the three main point of views types of writing styles the four basic writing styles and identifying the best fit for you they are not the ways of writing they are the writing styles okay aristotle's basic story structure and the story pyramid how to improve your writing the story hierarchy writing related concepts such as writer's block writing rituals free writing morning words blank page syndrome prompt writing idea journal etc then biggest insecurities faced by writers, especially beginner writers. Then security blanket for those writers so that they can deal with those insecurities. This is what I cover in fiction writing for beginners workshop. <coughs> Sorry. You will be provided with detailed workshop notes, writing exercises based on individual aspects of fiction writing and two bonus recorded lectures explaining execution of various literary devices and elements in famous works of fiction course fee is rupees 2000 per student and it includes all this available course batches i'll share the schedule with whoever shows interest in it i don't want to bore everyone with it so you can just whatsapp me if you're interested and want the details in written the timings would be 5 to 7 and it will go on till 8 o'clock in the evening. You will be provided a certificate of completion by Citrus Publishers, the publishing house for which I work as the editor-in-chief. Also, if you book the course today itself before 12 in the night, 12 midnight, 
then you will get a flat 25% off. This is only for the people who attended today's webinar, not the ones who will be watching it later on. Okay, so this is special discount 25% off 2000 rupees. And if you want critique reports of any of your three exercises that you will be doing from me, uh, my feedback provides valuable insights into your writing uh, and it will help you identify as well as improve your weak points, okay, weak areas in writing. So that will be 1000 rupees extra, but that is uh, optional, you know, if you want to take it, if you don't want to take it. So the course fee is 2000 rupees. Now I'm going to tell you novel writing masterclass. Many of you actually showed interest and this is actually my best-selling uh, workshop, novel writing. The, earlier I called it fiction writing masterclass, actually it is not a novel writing masterclass. Novel writing masterclass is a three-day intense novel writing workshop. Day one, it will again have two to three hours of lecture all the three days. Day one will be starting your novel. The topics would be finding the right idea for your novel, developing that idea using the techniques of brainstorming and mind mapping for novels in particular. Exploring the 10 most important literary themes, how to find the central theme of your novel, how to develop the central theme in your novel, fundamental elements of novel writing and I will be covering 15 fundamental elements. Writing the first draft of your novel using the simplified rendition, my simplified rendition of the snowflake method of writing so that was that that will be the first day these actually are pretty big topics so <coughs> they take a lot of time day two would be writing your novel okay the topics would be how to plot a novel and what exactly to do how exactly to do it the plotting the second topic is the 10 elements of plot structures then we have the 10 traditional plot structures including some of the best plot structures for writing novels within one to two months. Then we have how to develop realistic characters and I'll be talking about character arcs, character inner conflicts, character motivations, character stakes, character backstory and character profile sheets. How to create character profile sheets. I will also be providing a lot of resources to, I also provide a lot of resources to my students. So that will be included in that as well. Then on day three, we are going to talk about finishing your novel. The topics are understanding the difference between exposition, narration and description, point of views. And in this, we are going to discuss six types of point of views. Then we are going to talk about mastering the technique of show, don't tell, dialogue writing, scene writing, Chapter division in a novel, understanding the role of pacing and tension in a novel and how to control them, understanding control resolution, sorry, conflict resolution and ending in a novel, and self revising and self editing techniques. You will again be provided with detailed workshop notes, writing exercises, three bonus recorded lectures discussing main aspects of novel writing in famous works of literature in order to be able to make you understand each and every concept nicely. The course fee is rupees 3000 per student. I do not charge a lot because these courses are actually a lot more worth than I actually charge for because I'm not doing it for the money. I actually am just doing it for the serious writers who are actually willing to pay for writing, for learning to write, you know. So it is 3000 per student. If you want critique, the exercises are going to be longer in novel writing and in exercises, you can actually work on your own novel story ideas as well. So I will be providing you evaluation of five of your exercises or five of your own written pieces, uh, less than 1000 words, but not more than 1000 words for additional 2000 rupees. So this is about I have batches so again I will be sending the batches and the timings to the people who are interested but generally the timings would be 5 to 8 in the evening. Again you will be given a certificate of participation by Citrus Publishers and uh, that is it. If you book it before midnight today uh, then you will get 25% off on 3000 rupees. So that is all I have my workshops planned. Uh, the first they will be starting from the first week of November. 
and I will be having two to three batches of fiction writing for beginners and two to three batches of uh, two batches of novel writing uh, masterclass. Uh, I do not take more than eight to ten students in one batch because then it becomes very hectic and I teach on Google Meet so it's going to be a proper interactive workshop session. So let me know if you guys are interested in it and I will share more details or whatever you know. Uh, whatever you need so that's it i hope you guys enjoyed it i would uh, please like to request you all to please uh, if you like this webinar then please give a thumbs up uh, leave a comment because these comments are in the live stream right so please leave a comment on the video of this webinar uh, about saying about how did you like it or what uh, aspects that you particularly liked or you can just go to my facebook page and leave a review for me there it would really mean a lot to me thanks a lot for uh, attending today's webinar i really enjoyed it i hope you guys did too i do not see any more questions so i assume no one has any more questions i hope i'm right or maybe you're not able to just hear me not sure okay so Thanks a lot for attending. I'll be ending the stream soon. I'll give you all five minutes so that you guys can decide if you want to join the workshop or not. Just WhatsApp me on my personal WhatsApp if you want to join uh, my workshops or want to know more about them. Thanks a lot for uh, coming to my webinar today. Bye, guys. Bye. Take care.